Let me say good evening to everyone. Happy Wednesday to all of my friends and my church members that are watching. Um, we're so glad to have you join us this Wednesday, a beautiful Wednesday evening uh, that the Lord has blessed us with. Uh, all day long has been really nice here in Goldsboro and hopefully whatever area you are in the country or in North Carolina. I know in some areas you have experienced rain today, but we just thank God that you're here joining us here at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church, 318 Denmark Street, here in the great city of Goldsboro, North Carolina. We say grace and peace unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to all of our members and to all of our covenant partners, we uh, pray that you are doing well. We pray that you have enjoyed uh, the last weeks of uh, the eight-week study on Will God Heal Me and Why Do Good People Have to Suffer? That was a very inspiring lesson, I know, for me and hopefully for you. And so we're just glad to have you join us uh, again tonight, uh, sacrificing just an hour of your time uh, to teach another wonderful and awesome lesson that the Lord has given to me that I definitely want to share with you. And um, before I begin to teach and give prayer, I just want to remind all of us that we recognize that this month is a very important month, not only for those who have birthdays and uh, wedding anniversaries, but this is a Breast Care Awareness Month, and we recognize that we uh, pray for all of our mothers and uh, our sisters, our aunts, uh, those uh, church mothers in our lives, uh, nieces. Um, uh, that may be experiencing uh, this horrific uh, cancer. And we pray that you have your mammograms early and we pray your healing in the name of Jesus. And we are aware of it this month as, as well as every month. But especially this month, we recognize it. And uh, we pray uh, that if you have uh, breast cancer or you know someone that's suffering with it, we pray healing uh, in the name of Jesus. We just talked about that uh, a few weeks ago. So we encourage you in the name of the Lord. And also, this is uh, Domestic Violence Month. Uh, this horrific act of domestic violence, where it happens to a woman, in most cases it does, and men. It happens to men, although there are few cases, but yet domestic violence is domestic violence. And we pray that we can rid our community and our society of this horrific act against um, another gender or another sex. We, uh, we pray that we can eradicate that from our society and our community because it's a horrific action on the act of people who are just uh, not sensitive to other people. And so uh, we pray for those who are experiencing domestic violence and pray that God will intervene to make it all right. We also pray for the families uh, and the victims of those who are still experiencing suffering after Hurricane Ian. And we're praying for all of those families and we pray healing in the name of Jesus. Uh, we pray that uh, your lives will be reconstructed again. Uh, we pray that your families uh, will come together again and those who have lost loved ones in this horrific uh, hurricane. Uh, we pray your strength in the Lord Jesus. Amen. And we want to uh, encourage everybody, uh, this is the year of our midterm elections, and we're praying that everybody has registered to vote. And if you have not registered to vote, we pray that you make it a task to register to vote. And if you're able, we're asking that you early vote. Early voting is very, very important. But we pray whatever it is and whatever you do, please, next month, be prepared to vote in our midterm Amen. Now with that said, let's turn to our lesson uh, for tonight. Our lesson for tonight is entitled Character Education. It's entitled Character Education. The Lord gave me this because it was much needed or it is much needed in our churches. Uh, it's much needed to understand in our lives. Those who are, of us who have been born again, uh, faith believers in Jesus Christ, our character is very, very important. 
Now notice I said character education and not reputation education. Once again, I said character education, our personality, and not reputation uh, education. Because reputation is what other folks say about you. And a lot of people can say stuff about you that may not be true. They may not have seen all of you. But your character or our character is who we really are. And so I want to deal with that for the next couple of re weeks as we deal with character education. And I pulled this particular topical lesson from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 32 through 33. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I have on your syllabus, those who have the syllabus, I have verses 32 through 33. But we actually want to add one more verse in there, verse number 34. So 1 Corinthians 15, 32 through 34. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for allowing us to experience your presence today. Uh, Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that keeps us and guides us. and God anoints us with your spirit from on high. Now, Father, as we move forward into our lesson discussion tonight. We pray that someone will get clarity and understanding of how important their character is in this Christian faith walk. And Father, we pray that those who are chiming in by teleconference, those who are watching by Facebook, will share this message with others so we all can come to the conclusion that, the, that our godly character is what God expects from us as we deal with other people uh, in our society. So now God bless this, your teacher, and bless all of those that are watching and listening. In Jesus' name I pray, and the people of God say amen. Amen. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, the apostle Paul wrote of the false teachers who had come among them. They were teaching, or the false teachers were teaching, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ wasn't true. Let me say that again. Uh, Paul was addressing a serious problem at the Corinth. And as I stated a few weeks ago, or uh, maybe from the pulpit on Sunday, that Paul had a lot of issues, and there were a lot of issues he had to deal with in the city of Corinth. Uh, they were moving forward wonderfully at one time, then all of a sudden, uh, they started treading backwards, <laughs> okay, like some of us do today. He didn't have a lot of these problems in the church of Thessalonica, but here in Corinth, Paul was dealing with this issue of false teachers coming in to undermine his apostolic authority and the gospel message that he preached. So one of the biggest issues was the resurrection of Jesus Christ at one time, uh, according to Paul's gospel message, they believed in it. Then all of a sudden, when Paul left this uh, city, left this church, a lot of false teachers came in and said that it wasn't true, that Christ wasn't risen, uh, resurrected from the dead. Uh, these false teachers considered only their physical existence. They did not like after death or the resurrection, their moral outlook on life influenced the rest of the Corinthian believers. In other words, at first the Corinthians believed in the resurrection of Jesus, that gospel message that is the foundation of all of who we are in Christ is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and his resurrection. But all of a sudden, they, like most people today, allowed others who did not believe to infiltrate not only the church, but when you infiltrate the church, the church are people, that means you infiltrate people's hearts and their minds, and they're so convincing, they will cause us to turn away from the purity and the foundation of the gospel message. 
Paul is telling them, as well as the scripture teaches us tonight, that in associating with false teachers, we will be adversely influenced by them, right? Uh, the old uh, modern day idiom is, if you play with dirt long enough, it would get all over you. And so Paul was saying to this Corinthian church, and again, the scripture teaches us tonight, that we got to watch who we associate with. We got to be careful who we call our friends. We have to be very careful of who we allow to come into our atmosphere, into our orbit. Because everybody that you allow to come in, doesn't matter if it's church member, family, friends, people on your job. If you hang around people long enough who do not believe, one of the two is going to win over. Either you're going to stay steadfast in the gospel or you're going to be influenced by false doctrine. The truth is that false teachings do not lead to holiness. False teaching by false prophets and false teachers, it does not lead to holiness. It leads to darkness. It leads to disobedience. It leads to hatred, not holiness. As such, we, that's you and I, we must be careful who we form relationships with. You got to be careful, brothers and sisters, of who we form interpersonal relationships with. They sound good. They look good. I mean, their words are convincing, but it may not be for your godly purpose in Jesus Christ, especially those outside of the church. Unbelievers can cause even the strongest Christians to waver in their faith and adversely affect their walk with Christ. And once you affect a person's walk with Christ, you affect their witness to the world. Right? Let me say that one more time. Unbelievers that you meet in the gym classes. Unbelievers that you meet on your job. Unbelievers that sometimes you meet in the grocery store or just walking around or wherever you shopping malls, wherever you may go. Unbelievers right, can cause the strongest Christians. Don't ever think that you are intellectually smarter than Satan. The only thing that keeps us uh, from the power of or the influence of Satan to turn our backs on God is the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And you got to be very careful, brothers and sisters. I've been warning, uh, you got to be careful who you lend your ears to, right? Because Paul even wrote to Timothy that even in the last days, that these perilous times shall come where people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears to satisfy their own lust, their own selfishness, right? And I don't care how strong a man or woman say they are in Christ, uh, there's a line there that can be crossed if we continue to allow unbelievers to infiltrate our orbit. Amen. And when they infiltrate our orbit, uh, it clogs up our ears to the foundational gospel message that Jesus is alive. It clogs up our voices and our hearts to witness Jesus Christ to the world in the highways and the hedges, uh, uh, in the valley, on the hill. It, 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 it stops us from witnessing that God loves us, that God desires to save us, that God forgives us even of our most erroneous sins. There's no sin too great that our God cannot forgive. But you cannot witness to people if you allow unbelievers to infiltrate our ears, our eyes, and our hearts. Amen. This is why Paul tells us, y'all have to write this word down, 
Do not be misled. That's the key word. Do not be misled. And you can say amen to that. Do not be misled. If not checked at the beginning or left unchecked, they could begin to adopt such perverted ideas and behavior as normal. When a person or person is misled long enough, then what happens? They change a lie into the truth. And they begin to adopt such perverted ideas and behavior and call them normal, right? right? Like insurrection. Some people call it insurrections normal. The things that America is facing today, which is wrong, people call normal, right? Because they have dwelled in it long enough, even QAnon and things like that are showing its ugly head, and it sounds good, right? And, and, and it sounds like uh, uh, it, it's a purpose to be fulfilled. And if a person dwells in it long enough, it's going to change that person's behavior and they're going to call it a normality of life. And it's not. For this reason, dear brothers and sisters, Paul quotes a well-known proverb by the Greek poet Menander. Menander says, and this is our lesson for the night in character education, bad company bad company corrupts good and those who have my syllabus, I have different translations to bring home uh, what I mean in this lesson tonight. From the God's Word translation, listen closely, it reads, Don't let anyone deceive you. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Did I spell it wrong? I did spell it wrong. Ooh, it should be E right there. Don't be deceived. Got so caught up, it should be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you of being deceived. That means fooling you or pulling the wool over your eyes. Associating with bad people will ruin decent associate associating with bad people right what does associating mean hanging around allow them to be part of of you okay will ruin look at all these things will ruin decent Associating ruins decent people. I don't care how strong you think you are, how strong you may say you are, just keep hanging around long enough. And then the American Standard Version says, Be not deceived. Hear that word is again. Use the same word. Be not deceived. And it uses the word uh, evil. Evil companionship. He uses another word. Evil companionship. This comes from the standard American Standard Version. Evil companionship. What is companionship? That means a friendship. That means a fellowship. It says, it uses this word. It doesn't use the word ruin. It uses the word corrupt. Corrupts. Ruin and corrupts are the same thing. That's the uh, American Standard Version. And then the NIV says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Right? 
And then lastly, in the New King James Version, it says, do not be deceived. It doesn't use the word bad company. It used the word evil. Evil. Company corrupts good habits. Good habits. That's what it says. Look at all this. Corrupts, evil, deceive, ruin, associating, bad habits. Think of all those negative terms that happens when we associate with people, uh, associate with unbelievers that we allow to linger around us long enough. Right? And it's not that you're being judgmental of people. You know, because God has brought all of us from a long way. All of us were like sheep that have gone astray. There is none righteous, no, not one. Right? We all had to come to the knowledge of the truth of where we stand in Christ today. And because we have come this far by faith, uh, through the hills and through the valleys, through the rivers, uh, through ups and downs in life. And in this time, in this season, right, God has strengthened us and God has guided us. God has led us. We're stronger than we were before, but it ain't over yet. We still got rivers to cross. We still got valleys to go through. We still have mountains to climb with the help of the Holy Spirit. So we can't get caught up in just allowing people to come into our atmosphere to ruin, to corrupt, to deceive us because we think we're that smart. Right? It's only by the power of God. That's why it says, now to him who's able to keep us from falling. Right? And so you got to be careful in whom you place your trust. Man, because there it is again. Evil company corrupts good habits. Your habits have been uh, to love one another. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit has taught you. Habits, Christian habits is to forgive one another. Christian habit is to walk by faith and not by sight. A Christian habit is I give, or we give our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which our reasonable service, being not conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. We come a long way in this Christian journey. Amen. But if you start hanging around the wrong people because you think you got it all now, uh, then you better watch yourself. Because you'll find yourself going back to that same bad habit that God has released you from. Because we still live in a world of imperfection. We still live in a world of choice. And you got to choose what you're going to do at this stage in your life. So what is character? When you talk about corrupting good character, when you talk about uh, having good character or having decent people, when you're talking about good morals, we, when, we, uh, when you're talking about good morals, right? And here it is again, brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about our reputation, right? Because our reputation is a masquerading of what we want other folk to think about us. Right, so we can masquerade, like going to a masquerade party, you put on a mask, and no one really knows who's behind the mask. That's why the Bible decrees to us and teaches us that uh, uh, people, men and women, can see the outside, but only God knows who's behind the mask. God knows our heart. So, <clears throat> what is character? Let's get the practical understanding 
of what character is. Character, and you want to put a definition of character, character simply means individuality. That's what it means. Character means distinctiveness. Those two words. Characters, individuality and distinctiveness. It's the way we think. That's our character. The way we think, the way we feel, and the way we behave. That's it. So the way we think, feel, and behave. Now right there. Now that's your character right there, brothers and sisters. Nobody, and whenever you speak about character, you speak about character in the singular. It's never our characters. See, that's no such thing as character. There's no such thing as character. We talk about an individual. We talk about an individual. We, we mention the word character is in the singular. Okay? It's in the singular. So, how do you think? How do you feel? How do you behave? Not only in a, in, in a practicality, but how do you think, feel, and behave when you've been born again? That's what I'm trying to get you to. It's about the individuality and distinctiveness of who you and I are. God is going to judge us on that. God is not going to judge us on who we allow to come in and corrupt or ruin uh, our character. He's going to judge on us on individual basis, distinctiveness, how we think, feel, and behave. And how we treat one another. Our character defies everything we do to help others and ourselves. That's how we look at character. That's Christian character education. It defines us. Everything we do, listen, good character in Christ doesn't mind reaching out their hands to help her brother and sister up. Good Christian character doesn't mind going into the community to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Good Christian character is how we help one another, how we treat one another, feeding those who are starving, clothing those who are shaken in the frigid cold. That's our Christian character. That's not based on a reputation. But a reputation, you're trying to fool folk uh, for whatever type of uh, uh, status you want in your society or in your community. But a Christian character, in more cases than none, a lot of people don't even know what you're doing. But you are helping people, right? You're looking after the needs of more than just oneself. Oneself is important. How we Keep ourselves holy and acceptable unto God. It's very important. Listen to me closely, brothers and sisters. It is very important uh, because we really can't really authentically uh, help others if our lives are not connected to the Holy Spirit or if the Holy Spirit is not impregnated inside of us, right? That's our character, our personality. And although it may not appear what we shall be, the Bible says, we know we shall be like him, for we shall see the Lord as he is. But the Lord, our God, right, expects us uh, to be defined uh, by, our by our character. Our character defines us, right? uh, our sin. So when you look in the mirror, brothers and sisters, uh, you and I have to determine our character. Amen. You got to have a character that's so radiant. You have to have a character that is so awestruck. 
that people are attracted to you and that they're attracted to you by Christ living in you, you have witnessed to others, not only with your words, but you have witnessed to others about the love of God that works in you and me. Our character defines everything we do. Everything we do. Our character. Is our personality. Is our personality. Is who we are. Is what makes us. Especially how reliable. And these key words. And honest. We are. One, two. Y'all write those words down. Our character is our personality, especially how reliable, how honest we are. Listen, there are a lot of people that we meet along life highway. We know they got good character because we can rely on them. They're honest. In other words, whatever they say they're going to do, guess what? They do it. And I know there are things that happen that kind of prohibit us from doing sometimes the things we have promised others, but a person with good character will always call and never leave someone hanging. If they cannot perform the duty that they promised, they will call and say, well, maybe they had an accident on the road. Or maybe somebody in their family got real sick and needed to be rushed to the hospital. Unfortunately, maybe somebody may have died. Or unfortunately, maybe they have gotten sick. Right? That doesn't count against their reliability because we know that things in life happen. But they are reliable in what they say uh, because it's part of their personality complex. Listen, they are honest in their dealings. They're honest not in only what they say, but they're honest in their dealings. Have you ever met people that are reliable and honest? And then the reason you can continue to call on them is because they have proven themselves to have good, godly, and Christian character. If someone is of good character, again, they are reliable and they are honest. And if they are bad character, there's two words that are different than these two words. If they are uh, of good character, they are reliable and honest. But on the back end, if they are a bad character, a corrupted character, they are, uh, what do I hear, they are undependable, and they are dishonest. So this is good character, This is bad character. Right? You got two different types of people in, the, people in the world. There's no middle ground. See, there's no middle ground there. There's no middle ground. No. No middle ground. Either you're going to have good character, you're reliable and you're honest, or if people have bad character, you're undependable. And you're dishonest. Have you ever met somebody that's just the reverse of this? They're uh, uh, undependable. You sit there, you wait. They said they were going to be there at a certain time. And you're still there waiting for them like three hours later. They ain't called. They ain't text. They hadn't sent a smoke signal. They hadn't sent a telegraph or nothing. You, they said they were going to be there at 9. And they didn't get there at 12. Or sometimes they don't even come at all. I know we've had that happen in me and Trisha's uh, life at our home where somebody said they were going to do something. They didn't do it. We ain't heard from them to this Wednesday. We still ain't heard from them. They are, they are undependable. And when somebody's undependable, that means they're dishonest and God is going to judge that. That is bad character. And so the Bible teaches us, here it is again, that bad character, if you hang around, listen, you may have started off being reliable and honest in your dealings with people, 
You may have started off being reliable and honest at what you said to people. You were always on time. People could trust you. Then all of a sudden, you meet somebody, you know, they smile, you know, I said to something that smiling faces still, still tell lies. Listen, then all of a sudden you meet somebody, uh, they masquerade to be like this, but the more they uh, are in your orbit, you find out they're undependable, they're dishonest, but still, still you still allow them to fill in the blanks in your life. And after a while, he or she who found himself reliable and honest, all of a sudden finds themselves just like these folks. Right? Because it corrupts. Get it again. It corrupts good character. Listen. Bad company corrupts or ruins. Is that word again? Ruins. And I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. I don't know who's listening to me or who's watching me. But maybe somebody's got caught up in there. You know, and you've gotten out of it. To God be the glory. But you got to be careful. And you the people that are undependable and dishonest. Not all of them are unbelievers. You got some church folk that are undependable and dishonest, right? I mean, you got unbelievers. Yeah, we say unbelievers because they don't know the Lord. But you got people who know the Lord that will say one thing and do something totally different. And you can't depend on them. Amen. Amen. So, here are four things I want you to remember about character. Not only is it individuality, distinctiveness, how we think, how we feel, and how we behave, that good character is reliable and honest, uh, bad character is undependable and dishonest, and uh, bad character corrupts uh, good, uh, bad company corrupts good character. You know how that is. So let me give you four things. Let me give you four things here. And then I'll let you go. About godly character. Let me put it up here. It could be Christian character, or we could just say godly character. Okay? Number one. Good Christian or godly character helps us to understand four things. First of all, it helps us to understand God's perspective. Godly character helps us to understand God's perspective. Number two, it helps us understand our, our priorities. It helps us to understand our power. And lastly, it helps us to understand, understand our purpose. So, Godly character helps us to understand God's perspective. God's perspective. Somebody say, well, Pastor Gallon, what is God's perspective? There's so many things in the scripture that talks about God's view and God's perspective, but I chose only one. For 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll just write this down. Hope you got your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. It talks about God's perspective. Now, I know there are many. My challenge to you is look beyond what I'm giving you tonight because there are many that talks about God's perspective from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But for the sake of time, I chose this one. And it reads, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ their Lord and ours. So let's look at God's perspective. Paul says to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified. Y'all highlight that word sanctified. Sanctified means that God's perspective is that he is setting us apart. Sanctification means to be set apart to live holy lives. That's what it says and called to be his holy people, right? That's what God expects for us 
and our relationship with Jesus Christ, his son. God says, be holy, for I, your God, am holy. That's God's perspective. Listen, to be called, God wants a relationship with you and with me. And in order for God to have that relationship with us, we must be sanctified. And how are we sanctified? Through, what, through the atoning death of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. That's God's perspective. Together with all those everywhere who call on the name, on his name, not only for us, but people all over the world, people all in our society, to come to the conclusion or to come together is only by the act of sanctification that justifies us for us to stand right before our, God, our Lord. That's God's perspective. Through Jesus Christ. The reason Jesus Christ excuse me, came into the world, the reason he came into the world was to save sinners from their sin. And for those who believe on his name, God is sanctifying us. God is removing the dross and impurities that weighs us down. Y'all can say they read tonight. And when God starts to remove those dross and impurities that weigh so heavy on us, we begin to feel a little bit better. We begin to feel a little more closeness to God. Uh, and now we become the people of God. And in order to become the people of God, we have to be holy. Holy. That's what God wants us to be. Holy. So good Christian character helps us to understand that God wants us to be holy. And to be holy simply, to, simply means to live a holy life to him. I give my body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service of witnessing and worship helping one another and, and giving to one another and accepting it, the sanctification that's happening inside of us. But number two, good Christian character helps us to understand, number two, our priorities. Our priorities. Yeah. Our priorities. Uh, and I pulled that one from and there are a lot of scriptures that talk about that, but for the sake of time, I pulled it from 1 Corinthians. I think that's chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians, it talks about our priorities uh, as it relates to our Christian character. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, yeah, listen, agree, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. In mind. mind, and in thought. That's our priority. Our priority as it relates to a good Christian character is that we agree with one another. And it's not that we won't have some questions about decisions and things that we, that we make in our church service or in our ministries and in our lives. And what you say, but God wants there to be no division among the people of God. Because if we are divided, we're going to fall. Together we stand, and divided we will fall. Listen, there are many churches, brothers and sisters, y'all know it. You've been living a length of time like I have, you understand. There are many churches, there have been many families, of Baptists, of Christian associations, of conventions, People of God that have 
fell out with one another. Why? And they go start their own thing. People get mad at Pastor Yama. People get mad at Pastor whomever. People get mad at this church. They think they have a better way. They can't never agree on a drop of day. What they do, they pack their bags and they're getting out of here. They leave it. But our priority is that there is no disagreement or division among us. Sure, we don't have to agree on everything, but we have to agree on something in order for the kingdom of God to progress. Brothers and sisters, we live in what I call a minor post-COVID-19 era. And I said minor there as a disclaimer because COVID-19 is still out there and it's still a dangerous virus. Don't be fooled on that. Don't get caught up with false teachers and be fooled on that. It's still there. But as we're progressing eventually in 2023, if it be God's will and beyond, listen, we have to come together as a body of Christ so there is no division among us. That's our priority. And our priority is if there's no division among us, that means we must work together. We must talk to each other. We can't just walk past somebody like you don't see them, like they're a ghost or something. You got to talk to people. You got to love people. Sure, you may not have agreed with me on this choice or that choice, but I'm going to work with you, brother. I'm going to work with you, sister, so there is no division among us. And when there's no division among us, we don't give Satan an opportunity to come and split us apart but that you be perfectly united in mind. That word perfectly doesn't mean perf complete perfection. That means we're working toward it, united together in our thinking and in our thoughts. And the first thing we must be reminded of in our priorities it is that it is God that saved us. And if you're dealing with other believers, it is God that saved all of us. So there's no division in that because we all can agree that it was Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ and the atoning death at Calvary and the resurrection on the third day morning that we believe in. We don't have any disagreements about that like the church of Corinth did. We believe that Jesus Christ uh, suffered, bled, and died. We believe that they took him up the Via Della Rosa. We believe that they hung him high and they stretched him wide. We believe that his blood came streaming down. We believe that he hung from the sixth to the ninth hour. We believe that he said, Father, into your hand I give you my spirit. We believe that he died on the old rugged cross. We believe that the earth began to really rot like a drunken man. We believe that the dead bodies got up and walked around in Jerusalem. We believe that Joseph and Arimathea took him off the cross. We believe that he laid there in the tomb Friday, Saturday, but early on Sunday morning he was resurrected from the dead by the power and the glory of his father. We believe that, right? There's no uh, divisions among that. But how we operate in a missional minded church, there may be some disagreement, but we all are to come into one unity to say we're going to find a happy medium of how we're going to move our church forward in the name of the one that was resurrected over 2,000 years ago that we all can agree on. Amen. So let there be no divisions among you. Good Christian character helps us to understand God's perspective, our priorities, and number three, our power. Listen, God gives us power. Holy Ghost power from on high. If you got the Holy Ghost, God gives you power. And I pulled that from Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. But you will receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. Let me stop there in that A clause. It says, you will receive. Who was you? That was the disciples he was talking to uh, in Acts and Luke's writing there. And it's for us today. You will receive what? Power. Godly character, listen, helps us understand our power. And 
We don't have any power unless it comes from the Holy Spirit that falls on us. When the Holy Spirit uh, lives in us, it ignites Holy Ghost power. Power to do what? Power, the first thing that it says in this next clause is to be a witness. It didn't say to take from it, not power to take from someone, not power to be selfish, not power to bring everything to ourselves, not power to have a, you know, just uh, being a dictator over folk, but it says power to do what? Power to witness. Listen, the word witness comes from a word that means martyr. Martyr means are you willing to die for what you believe in? There were many over the annals of history that have done it. Paul, Dr. King, there were many that have died. Uh, the disciples, others that have died at, for what they witnessed, for what they believed in. But listen, they had power, power to tell others uh, when they were wrong. Power to tell others uh, how good God is. Power to witness. It says here in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to all the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, God says here in Acts 1 and 8, go back to the city, right, where my name is placed. That Zion Hill David, Jerusalem, where King David sat there and built the city. Go back there to the religious leaders that crucified my son. Go back to the, the center of religion there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem up on a hill. Go there and witness there first because that's where the prophets were slain. Uh, there's uh, no prophet that died outside of Jerusalem. It was there where they had accusations against our Lord. It was there right, where they beat them all night long. It was there in Jerusalem. And they left there and took them to Pilate's the judgment bar. He said, be my witnesses there first. Go to those religious leaders, those Pharisees, those teachers of the law, and, and witness to them that Jesus is alive. And when you get there, God says, you're going to have power. Listen, and not only in Jerusalem, but go to all the providence of Judea. Go uh, all over all the people that denied Jesus, all the people that believed and some that did not believe, go witness to them too. Then go on down to Samaria. You know, there was a big problem between the Jews and the Samaritans. They didn't even like each other. That's why they got all tore up when Jesus was speaking with the woman at the well, right? That's why they got all messed up when uh, the man from Jericho, excuse me, the man from Jericho was beaten and left for dead. Everybody passed him by, but there was a good Samaritan. They, they didn't understand that story, but go witness there, Jesus says. Go witness to your enemies, but you're going to have power. And then he says, to all the ends of the earth. How does that speak to us today? God gives us power. You can't be a scared Christian. God gives you power, brothers and sisters. Let me say that again. Our character helps us understand if God has saved you, God gave you power. Can you say power? You got power to witness, brothers and sisters. You can't be a scared chicken. We used to sing old song a long time ago. God don't need no coward soldier. Now, if you're going to be a coward soldier, stay at home and watch gun smoke on TV all night. But God wants us to be uh, uh, witnesses and you got to walk in faith that he gives us power to witness and to tell others. And like Esther said, if I die, let me die. But I got to go tell the king something. Amen. I got to go tell people something. Ooh, have mercy, my Lord. Good Christian character helps us to understand. This is the last one. I'm going to bid you good evening. Not only does Christian character help us to understand God's perspective, not only does good Christian character help us to understand our priorities, not only does uh, good Christian character help us to understand our power, but lastly, it helps us to understand our purpose. We have a purpose. We live a purpose-driven life. If you're born again, God drives us. Right? God quickens us. His spirit quickens us. Right? It wakes up those dead things that were in us and it quickens us, right? We live a purpose-driven life. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Oh, 
Like I said, this is not an exhaustible list. There are others you're going to be. There are many scriptures that talks about the purpose, our purpose. But I pulled this one out, and I pulled another one out, Jeremiah 29 and 11. About Calvary, no, I preached this not too long ago about our purpose. So I pulled two out. When it talks about our Christian character, helps us to understand, first of all, Jeremiah 29 and 11. He says, God says to the prophet, the prophet says to the people, for I know the plans I have for you. Who said that? God says that. We don't know all that God has purpose driven us to do in this life, uh, but God tells Israel, as well as he tells the people of God today, I know it. The plans I have for you declares the Lord. And sometimes in God's blueprint for us, he does not expose us to everything at one time because if God did that, some of us will walk away and not want to do it. But God says, I know it. I planned it out for you. He says, number one, I have plans to prosper you. You see, I like that. I, I like what he told Israel that because, you know, Israel were, was coming out of Babylon and they need a message of encouragement. They needed a message of hope. It was a message of, really, a message of reclamation and restoration, okay? Restoration and reclamation. Because God says, I have plans to prosper you. Is anybody listening to me tonight or watching me tonight know that's true, that God's plan is to prosper you? Anybody been prosperous in the Lord? God can prosper us materialistically. You got more now than you had 10 years ago. You got more now than you had 20 years ago. God prosper us in our spirituality, with our joy, with our peace, with our contentment, with our long suffering. God has prospered us. We've grown up in the name of Jesus. Amen. He has prospered us, right? We, we're walking a new walk right now with that power I just talked about. He has prospered us. He's given us more than we deserve. He's prospered us with his grace. He's prospered us with his mercy. He's prospered us with that new bank account. He's prospered you with that new job. He's prospered you with that new car. Oh, you just got that new house. God has prospered you. Look, last year I was sad, but God has prospered me, and I'm glad. You know, God saved us from COVID-19, where many others have I had to say goodbye to loved ones. Many lost their lives, and, and we pray for all of the families, but God has prospered you. You got land. You got cars. God has been good to you. God says he got plans to prosper you with his spirit. He prospers us, uh, and not to harm you. You don't have to be scared of God. Listen. Yes, yeah, God sometimes has to pass judgment on us, not because he's a bad God, but, but because we were bad people, right? Come on, parents. Where are my parents at tonight? Listen, your plan is not to harm your children uh, when they cut up and act up and, uh, and when the parents say smelling in their arms, cutting the monkey and all that stuff. Uh, the plan for uh, most parents is uh, the reason uh, mom and dad had to get us is so we can wake up and be uh, an asset to the community instead of a liability. Uh, some children didn't learn that, and I understand there are still some child abuse cases all over the world. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a parent that loves their children, don't want to harm their children. They want to see their children prosper and grow the right way. Can I get a witness here? Uh, plans to give you hope and a future. Israel didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't know where they were going to go. God says, I'm giving you restoration. I'm giving you a new hope. I'm renewing your mind. I'm restoring your life. I'm giving you hope and a future. See, brothers and sisters, you can't let the enemy come in and destroy what God's plans are for you. That's Christian education. That's why it says again that bad company cor corrupts good character or ruins good character. God has already prophesied Jeremiah 29 and 11 in your life. You have already accepted it, that God is ready to prosper me. God don't want to harm me. God wants to give me hope. God wants to give me a future. Then all of a sudden, you let Jabbo or Joe Blow come into your life and destroy that character that God has already planned for you. Can I get a witness here tonight? Listen. God don't want to harm us. 
He wants to push us. It's a purpose-driven life. He wants to push us into that glorious season that's awaiting for us. Listen, Canaan land was already there. Brothers and sisters, Israel had it. They had it. God had prepared Canaan, uh, what we call the promised land. They didn't even have to work for it. And God says to them, all I want you not to do is intermingle with bad company, with unbelievers. Do not mingle with foreign nations because if you mingle with foreign nations, the Jerusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, if you uh, uh, intermingle with them and start marrying their wives and having kids and all that stuff, they're going to corrupt the plans I have for you. So what God tells Israel is, I'm going to shut you down for 70 years till you get it right. But after 70 years, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to prosper you. I don't want to harm you. I want to give you a future. The promised land has already been there. I had to let it rest for a while because you desecrated it. I, it was consecrated. You desecrated it. But since after 70 years, I'm going to let you go back to it. Or hopefully you learn your lesson for your future. Last but not least, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. And I hope I'm talking to somebody tonight about character education. It says, each of you, that's you and me, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Let me break that down for you real quick. Help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, a gift. The gift is a heavenly endowment, really, that we don't deserve. As disobedient as we have been, but when you are born again, when God saves us, y'all listening to me? Listen to me. When God saves us, Peter, 1 Peter tells the people of his day, as well as the scripture teaches us tonight, that whoever is born again, whoever is endowed with the heavenly gift from on high, listen, you should use that gift. Some have different forms. That's what it said, various forms. Some have different forms. Some have more than one gift. It doesn't matter. If you want, if you have one, don't go bury it. Use it. When you use your gifts, brothers and sisters, here it is again. You got to serve others. Your gift and your salvation is not just about you. Y'all hear me? It's not just about you. It's not a selfish gift. You got to use the gift to serve others. That's why Jesus always used the parable about people working in a vineyard, right? Laborers in the vineyard. People being hired throughout the course of the day to go work in the vineyard. That's what our gift is for. Our gift is not just to sing a song on a Sunday morning and we clap our hands and praise God for that. Our gift is not only just for praying. There's some people that can pray. I know at Mount Calvary, I got about two or three people that can pray till the building begins to shake. That's a gift. But there are the various gifts, gifts of administration that the church needs, gift of outreach, gift of evangelism. There are people with culinary gifts. There are people with with uh, all types of gifts that God blesses us with, but we have to use those gifts not only in the facility or in the in the building called the church, but that gift should be used to, to help others, to serve others, to witness to others the cause of Christ and, and the kingdom agenda. That's what Jesus did. Jesus spent a small percentage of his ministry in the church. You didn't Whenever he went to the, uh, the synagogues or whenever he went to the temple, he was blessing folk out because they were doing wrong. But whenever he went down in the province of Galilee, down in Capernaum, he met people and they gathered around him to hear him teach. They gathered around him because he was healing folk. The Bible said they were bringing folk to him who were lame and who were filled with devils. And the Bible said he healed them all. It is to serve others. Serve others how? As faithful stewards, right? I said it earlier. 
Good Christian character is reliable and is honest. And that word I want to use is faithful, a faithful steward. Stewardship simply means that you have been handed something that you really don't own. It's the owners, right? And God trusts us to be good stewards of what he has given us to serve others. Uh, you're handling somebody else's property, right? Of God's grace, his unmerited favor in his various forms. So in other words, brothers and sisters, I end the class tonight, part one, get ready for part two or next week. Character education, again, is about this. 1 Corinthians uh, 32 through 33. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? Paul says that all of this is for nothing. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So all of that fighting, all of that preaching and teaching, all of those beatings and imprisonments for nothing. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses, brothers and sisters, as you ought, and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. In other words, Paul would say, stop sinning and get out there and start witnessing because if you don't, it's to your shame. That's the word of God for the people of God. God bless each and every one of you. May have a smile on you. I kept you a little longer than I'm supposed to, uh, but that's happened sometimes when I'm really teaching because I love teaching the word of God. I hope someone has been blessed by this Christian education. If you want a copy of my syllabus, then just call the church between 9 and 2 tomorrow, 919-735-3242, uh, or just type your email address or on this Facebook channel, and we'll get you a copy of the syllabus, and then we'll get you a copy of part two. Uh, I'll put you on my email list for next week, and you get a copy of part two. Character education. Father, we thank you for allowing us to speak tonight with clarity, uh, cohesiveness. God, we'd like to thank you for allowing us to speak with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, dear Father, that people will understand that bad character can corrupt us. And Father, I pray that each and every person that witnessed with me tonight will be blessed. Father, I want you to bless their families and their friend circles. Bless them on their jobs. Father, I pray for Mount Calvary. I pray for the families that we have lost here at our church within this last two to three years. I pray for each and every family. I pray for the members here, God, that are still going through a bout of sickness. And Father, I pray for our members that have not even come back yet. And wherever they may be, God, touch them and bless them and keep them in your care. Father, I thank you for Mount Calvary, Father, and I thank you for uh, all of our covenant partners. Father, I ask that you would bless their families and their friend circles and people on their jobs. Father, I ask that you would touch our enemies too, God. Heap coals of fire on their heads so they can come to the knowledge of truth that it's all about the character that, God, you expect from us. And Father, in it, even in our world today, in our political world and our religious sectors. God, we need you, Father. For it seems like men and women in our politics and even in our religion have turned their backs on you, God, and then lean to their own understanding. They have never acknowledged that it's only you that can make the world a better place. So, Father, I ask that you would hear this my prayer, Father, that it be thy will, God, continue to bless us and keep us and Share your grace upon us, God, until we see each other again and talk again. Be with us and guide us in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen. God bless you. Have a smile on you. We love you. Look forward to speaking with you on next week. God bless you.